Welcome uh, to the 8 a.m. meeting. I have 8 o'clock um, of the Transportation Appropriations. Uh, and so we will go ahead and get started. We're going to look at the uh, fiscal year 22 uh, budget as it relates to um, transportation. And we'll hear from the presenters. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for the members that, uh, that are here and the great questions uh, and insight that you will provide in this meeting. Uh, before we begin, let's uh, open in a quick word. Bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this beautiful day for the opportunity, the privilege that we have to come before you in this building that there's a tremendous heritage that has been set before us. Please grant us wisdom. Please uh, grant the, the presenters uh, wisdom as the facts become clear in their head and the, and the numbers they use. Lord, help us to lead this state um, with good stewardship uh, to benefit uh, the great people of this great state. In your name I pray, amen. I think on the line that we have, uh, Commissioner McMurray, are you with us, Commissioner? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, I am here. Okay, would, uh, would you like to get us started, please, sir? Yes, sir, it's my honor and thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for uh, taking time this morning to look at the FY 2022 governor's recommendation. Let me pull my presentation up and we'll get going. Second. Can you have it, is that his? You gotta share the screen, one second. Trying to find the uh, file and share. It's not showing up. I'm gonna grab it. One second, Mr. Chairman. Technology is smarter than I am. And I go to share, it's not showing up. Mr. Commissioner, I ab completely understand that sentiment uh, and it, it applies to me as well. Uh, we do have um, one of my uh, members, uh, Representative Billy Mitchell, that is on. Uh, on the Zoom call. Um, representative, if, if you don't mind, if you do have a question, would you uh, type it in the chat feature and uh, Abby will make sure that we relay it. So, uh, Billy. Will do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner, we're ready. Okay, Mr. Chairman, despite technical difficulty, I hope you can see that. Can you affirm that you see the presentation? I will confirm that. Thank you. All right. Well, let's uh, get started and uh, move forward okay. and jump right in. Um, well, I'm trying to advance the screen, I'm sorry. This, we're having technical difficulties this morning. All right. It feels like Monday, but it's not. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chairman, we'll start with overall funding uh, as it relates to transportation, uh, starting with our FY21 as the base, uh, looking at the changes, and obviously that becomes establishment of the FY22 budget. Uh, we start with excise across the top, seeing the base at 1.743 million with an increase of 216.1 million. And as I presented last time, we've seen some positive trends in motor fuel, and this is reflected in the economist's forecast, obviously into FY22. Uh, this would actually put the excise about 2% higher than it was back in FY20 pre-COVID uh, and about 3% higher as we had the amended, 20, uh, uh, amended FY 2020 as sort of that benchmark of sort of pre-COVID into COVID. So again, I, I suggest that this is a, a positive trend. As we look down to what we call non-excise, those are transportation fees and, and the like, 
uh, you can see an ad of basically 32.3 million. Um, and you note on the left side of the screen, there is a deduct for the ATL that was in the base that's actually added back in the change because the ATL is now administratively attached to GDOT. So it shows there. You can see uh, Greta uh, deduct as well out of the base uh, to fund Greta. What is left is across the bottom of $2.089 billion is the transportation excise uh, and fees that come to the department that is, is the basis for our budget. And I might add that the FY22, 2.089 billion is about 55 million more than was in the amended 21. So just again, to give you some basis as comparison, uh, that is an increase. So let me move to the next slide. Would you say that last number one more time? Um, the, um, was it 50? Five million. Fifty-five million. So 2022 is about 55 million greater than amended 21. Which in my opinion is good news. <laughs> Heading the right direction. All right. So on this next slide, Mr. Chairman and members, we always like to sort of aggregate our budget together uh, from the different budget programs really into more of a functional uh, look at the department and the biggest column at 971 million is the combination of three budget programs, capital construction, capital maintenance and local roads admin, which constitutes the largest portion of our state budget at 46%. So think of those as actual projects and uh, what it takes for um, the capital part of any project that might include right of way acquisition, et cetera. The next uh, column is general operations of where we've aggregated five budget programs together, uh, construction admin, departmental admin, data collections, our planning function, and also our traffic operations functions. At $232 million, that's about 11% of our overall state budget. The next column is a very important one, especially to all your, your constituents as the local maintenance improvement grant program, which is at 10% or $196 million. Again, a great program that helps with local needs uh, significantly. The next largest column we have as well is routine maintenance. And again, uh, it constitutes 430.8 million. That's about 21% of our budget. So I always like to think about it as the capital programs or the projects, the routine maintenance is taking care of the house, if you will, of everything that needs to be done. And when you aggregate those two together, you can see that is the lion's share of our budget. Uh, the next column is uh, payments to CERTA. And we will talk about that in a little more detail. Uh, then intermodal program at $21.9 million. That's about 1%. Our geo bond debt is 145 million. That's about 7% of our state budget. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, you can see the attachment to the ATL in the far right column. So let me take a little bit deeper dive now into the actual budget programs. Let's start at the very top with geo bond debt service. Uh, it increased uh, by about $15.2 million up to $145 million this year. Uh, you can see that this, and let me, not, let me say this, this chart is all motor fuel as the heading indicates. And on the next chart, I'll show you where transportation fees are being utilized. So this is the bond debt. The next program is capital construction. So those are the projects, uh, big projects uh, includes uh, right away in construction. Uh, you can see that it's increased by $99.4 million. So our largest and significant increase to the budget is in this program brings the total to $839.4 million. Uh, these funds will help us to deliver some of the projects that have been deferred because of impacts to COVID and funding. Uh, and just as by way of comparison, I always like to continue to reflect back, that's a 6% increase over amended FY21. 
So also in the budget, the governor's budget recommendations, there's two new budget uh, items, uh, not programs, but just listed as reference. Uh, and now let me talk about those. The first one uh, is the freight uh, focus program of freight operations. Uh, both of these programs were uh, implemented by our planning director, Janine Miller. And the freight operations program is to assist in improving roads and bridges facilities that are really heavily traversed by trucks and more small scale investments uh, that help address safety and help efficiency of freight movement. Uh, I like to talk about these uh, projects that they're bigger than what we could do with our quick response program of which many of you are familiar with, which are sort of limited to about $200,000 but not a full fledged big capital project. You know, there's improvements that need to be made uh, where truck, a lot of times it's truck radiuses or there's turn lanes needed that may help facilitate freight flow in areas, things like that. But, you know, they're, they're a little bit bigger than what we can do uh, at the district level, but not necessarily a full fledged big capital project. So we're excited about that. The second program, I think uh, everyone will find great interest in and it's, rural, it's the Rural Development Initiative. And it's really to help uh, situations in rural Georgia outside of our metropolitan planning organizations, uh, again, talk, targeting safety, uh, potentially innovative solutions and partnering with uh, counties where there's grad sites already established or we need to help facilitate a transportation improvement such that they're, they are market ready for industry and so again, sort of continuing to build on the a strong tradition we have here of working with local governments to bring uh, investment into their communities to such that we continue to remain the number one state to do business. These programs are a total of federal and state combined of 10 million each, $6 million this year is state funds, 4 million in each program are federal. So. Uh, the planning division will continue to develop the sort of procedures and the standard operating procedures, if you will, of how to deploy these dollars. And so we look forward to developing this program in this year and for it continuing on. So just wanted to highlight that for a moment. Uh, let me jump down uh, under capital construction is capital maintenance. Again, uh, this is taking care of state of good repair of roads and bridges. Uh, we show an increase of $45 million there. So the next largest increase is there to a total of 127 million. Uh, construction admin is next. And let me talk just a little bit about construction admin. Mr. Chairman, as you know, we had a conversation and I thought it was very fruitful that this title may be misleading because construction admin is actually the program of project delivery. So this is the work by engineers, our environmental staff, right away, uh, every uh, construction inspection, management and testing of materials. It's everything it takes to deliver a project and inspect a project and to finally close it out. So I think the admin throws people, this is not really an administrative function, it's a project delivery function. So I just wanted to highlight that because people are like, well, what's that mean? So. Uh, I appreciate the conversation we had and hopefully that helps other members understand what that is. Uh, that change is reflective of what uh, the House did for Amendment 21 and that really helps us to establish our base back to where it needs to be uh, due to reductions from several years ago. So we're appreciative, appreciative of that from Amendment 21 and certainly uh, the governor's recommendation has that in 22 as well. Uh, the next change is departmental admin, which is more traditional of what you think of admin, of accounting, uh, financial management, uh, legal, all those things that it takes to actually run the department. And again, this uh, change of $3.5 million in the governor's recommendation was uh, also supported in Amendment 21 by the House. So again, to sort of reestablish our base to where we need to be. Uh, as you recall, I showed you some charts of personnel, and this will help us uh, maintain uh, and recruit personnel and hopefully maintain them. Uh, next is LMIG, as I talked about, that's the adjustment to marry up the, uh, to the excise collected uh, or forecast rather. 
$196 million. So having an increase of 21.6 is positive, obviously to our local partners. And then last change is down in routine maintenance, uh, adding back $35.1 million. Uh, this matches up to the budget of amended 21. So we're thankful for that. Uh, the biggest share of that $25 million goes to our uh, small contracting opportunities. We call invitations to bid. Uh, and the balance of that is spread between additional stropping, uh, contract litter pickup, and our herbicide programs to try to keep our roadsides in good conditions. As you see payments to CERTA, you can see a reduction of $9.6 million. I'll get into that on the next slide and Chris Thomason will talk about that in his budget as well. Let me move forward to the next slide. Now this table, Mr. Chairman and members are the fee component of where the fees are used. Uh, as I was talking about debt service, we were able to uh, fund part of our debt service with transportation fees. We did not, we were not able to do that in the base, but in the governor's recommendation, we're able to use 19.4 million uh, to put toward that geo bond debt service. In payments to CERTA, they, there is no change. Um, and uh, let me talk just a little bit about payments to CERTA. I know Chris will get into it in detail. It basically consists of uh, our requirement to pay debt service uh, from previous debt service uh, and also gets into GTIB and then Chris will talk to you about a, a financing strategy uh, that we're all in agreement with uh, due to some incredibly great rates in the market right now. Uh, so he'll take a deeper dive in that. As I mentioned before, the uh, payments to ATL, uh, ATL is administratively attached. So that's just showing their budget at $12.8 million. And then lastly, intermodal, no changes. Uh, this is the same budget as it was in amended 21 at 1%. So next in proposed in 2022 are $100 million of general obligation bonds for roads and bridges. Our intent is to deploy those to 12 bridge replacements, state bridge replacements and four capital projects. What we have identified uh, as of now for the bridge replacements would be over 12 bridges in 11 counties. Those counties are Evans, Webster, Fayette, Sumter, Spalding, Madison, Macon, Chattooga, Elbert, Floyd, Floyd, and Jefferson. So as you can see, sprinkled all around the state, we have bridge needs across this great state everywhere. Uh, and then the four capital projects we propose to advance are ones that we had to defer due to lost revenue uh, due to COVID. So those would be on State Route 9 in Forsyth County, State Route 20 in Henry County, uh, US 441 in Washington County, and US 27 in Troop right in LaGrange. Uh, that's where we would uh, propose to utilize these dollars. And then also a $10 million short line rail bond uh, would be utilized for the Heart of Georgia Railroad and Georgia Southwestern Railroad. The Heart of Georgia Railroad improvements about $7 million, a little over $7 million to upgrade their bridges and track between Preston and Vidalia. And on the Georgia Southwestern Railroad, uh, we propose to upgrade bridges and tracks between Cuthbert and Lynn, Lynn rather, and uh, so again, that state of good repair and just keeping up the state on rail lines, trying to get those to what's the class two standard, the 286,000 pound and 25 mile an hour speed is where we're trying to continue to make those investments. Let me jump into the next slide. I added this late and you may not have it if Abby passed out uh, copies or advanced copies to you, and, but I wanted to talk about this federal coronavirus response and relief supplemental appropriations act. In the previous budget presentation for amendment 21, I shared with this committee the, uh, the flexibility of those federal dollars and there were additional federal funding that was intended to supplement the lost state revenue. And so I've had, since that presentation, I've had many members to suggest that they had a project list for us. So uh, 
I wanted to go back and reaffirm that this is trying to make up for the lost revenue of which we did defer projects. Our, our estimate going back to 2020 pre-COVID and projecting forward to where we think we would have been if it wasn't for COVID has us somewhere in this our approximation about $317 million of revenue loss to GDOT. So the federal funding to Georgia by formula was $320.3 million, uh, of which is broken down to 277 million for GDOT's utilization. And then the metropolitan planning organizations greater than 200,000, you can see the breakdown below of the four MPO areas greater than 200,000 in population. And so those dollars are very uh, welcomed and we greatly appreciate having that opportunity to sort of backfill the hole created by COVID to the state. Obviously, 277 is less than 317, but uh, we're very grateful to have the 277 to try to backfill in advanced projects that otherwise have been deferred or delayed. Uh, I just wanna, again, thank the House in Amendment 21 we were able to basically do a fund source swap of the federal funds of $92.2 million, uh, which we're able to reduce capital maintenance at the state budget and move that into capital construction, uh, which helps us again, move those bigger projects forward uh, without the federal uh, requirements because we can use the federal dollars for our capital maintenance program, which has uh, more streamlined uh, environmental permitting and uh, approval processes. So for 2022, Mr. Chairman, we uh, would ask your favorable consideration to work forward with the committee on uh, providing a similar approach of which we can use the federal COVID funds for capital maintenance projects. Uh, again, those are 100% uh, federal funds, no state match required and then move some of the money as presented in capital maintenance in the state budget to state funded capital construction. So I know that's a lot of complication, but we would uh, we appreciate the previous support uh, given in Amendment 21 from the House and look forward to uh, having the same conversation with you as 22 advances. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and the members uh, for your attention. I'm glad to entertain your questions and com comments. Uh, well, well, thank you for that, Commissioner. Uh, one thing I would like uh, to just explain for the good of the committee. So uh, after we passed the, the budget of the House, some of the changes that were made um, uh, on the other side had to do with uh, recognizing some of this CARES money the Commissioner had just mentioned. Uh, and uh, shifting some money. And th there was one question I had for you. Um, so there was $92 million in change uh, that we used to backfill some projects and move some money around so we can do more projects uh, that you were, you were anticipating that had been put off. Um, when do you think we can get a pretty good number um, so that we could go ahead and uh, calculate that into our um, house presented uh, transportation budget um, and uh, w when, when do you think that that might be coming down the pike that we'll know what we can plan and budget for? Mr. Chairman, we're actively working on that. I would hope by uh, in the next day or two we'd have that firmed up to the penny. Okay. We're, we're in the ballpark now but we're working to make sure of what we swap around uh, that we can deliver those projects that, as we call them, we take them off the shelf, dust them off, and make sure they move forward. So, and I, Mr. Chairman, if you can, a uh, day or two would be a gracious help to, to us. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, for the, as I'm talking about some housekeeping things, for members of the committee, if you look on your tracking sheets at 47.1.2, uh, and 47.1.3. Uh, the commissioner had, had talked about uh, this utilizing $10 million in existing funds uh, for uh, various infrastructure issues and rural broadband, uh, emphasizing the broadband. 
Um, for our purposes, we're going to add language there to make sure that it is spelled out. Now, this is nothing uh, from the commissioner, but uh, to, to explain that six million of the 10 is state funds, four million is uh, funding from the federal government um, on 47.1.2 and 47.1.3. There's also a typo on 47.1.2 uh, that should read utilize existing funds to improve freight efficiency and truck safety. Uh, this is not a rail type issue, so it, it will read truck safety just so that when it comes up um, and it, it does not confuse you. So uh, those are uh, some of the um, housekeeping things that I wanted to clarify for members of the committee to make sure we're on the same page. The governor's floor leader, Representative Larickia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner McMurray. We can't say enough how much we appreciate you and your team and our DOT board from the district engineers down to the regions that we all represent. And uh, however, uh, you're aware that there are some measures moving through this General Assembly regarding truck weights. And you will, uh, you will hear all of us say how essential transportation infrastructure is and has been to what we all brag is to be in the number one state in the nation for business and economic development and creating jobs and and you are to be commended and your team for helping us work through that and uh, we know that uh, transportation infrastructure is essential to getting goods to the markets and getting people to the markets to get the goods uh, but during this time of covid one of those goods that people were struggling to get was toilet paper and uh, we have to think about who makes the toilet paper, and that's the people that turn trees into paper. And in my district, we are heavy in the uh, forestry and timber industry. And um, I guess my comment, uh, Commissioner, is that we look forward to working with you and your team as we move forward to find that balance of what we might be able to do to help that industry with uh, the economic disadvantage that they have of loading some of these trucks much lighter than our bordering states. And uh, I'm not sure what that will look like. I'm not sure of a number, but I, I do know that uh, in my district in particular, uh, I get lots of calls and concerns about, let's just take in that deep dive into what we might be able to do to put them on a level playing field economically, but continue to make safety of our roads and trucks and, and the people a number one priority. And I, I wasn't sure if you might would have a comment about that, but I did want to bring it up because as you know, there's a number of measures uh, that we will be looking at over the next few weeks uh, that attempts to address that, but we certainly want to partner with you and your team to move forward in a fair and reasonable and safe way. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for those comments and you know we always stand ready to work collaboratively and and share data and as you look at the economic impacts to that industry we will be glad to share with you what we think the infrastructure impacts are such that this body can you know make the best decisions possible as you move forward and uh, as always uh, we always welcome and appreciate the opportunity to work with uh, all the members and all the committees. So thank you for that. And we look forward to having a conversation as it presents itself. Commissioner, good morning. Um, Representative Paris is online and she has a question from a constituent regarding cutting down trees and vegetation removal along the interstates. And um, she would like to know the purpose of those kinds of projects and what the cost typically is. Thank you. Uh, the first and primary consideration of what we call vegetation management along our interstates and freeways is safety, period. The number one cause of fatalities are run off the road uh, accidents hitting fixed objects. The fixed objects are generally trees. So we're trying to recover our roadways in what's called the clear zone or the safety area that if an errant vehicle leaves the road, it has an opportunity to recover before it hits uh, the engineering terms of fixed object or a tree or structure or something like that. 
So uh, this is being done from a safety point of view. Uh, it does help with aesthetics and uh, obviously we can get our roadsides looking a little better as well, uh, which we get a lot of accolades for that, for being able to have roadsides that are a little more tidy and neatly uh, a neater look. But safety is why we're doing that. Uh, I don't, as far as cost goes, we allocate uh, budgets to the districts uh, and they maintain those. Uh, we'll have to follow up if there's a specific, you know, for what it actually costs. Uh, obviously, uh, these timber uh, is what's harvested. Uh, some of it's mulched, some of it's harvested. So it sort of varies by project. Uh, again, it's a, it's a low bid uh, situation such that we're getting the best value for the taxpayer. Uh, and so, we'll, and it probably varies by topography, but we can, I can uh, get the sort of budget number of what we allocate for that function uh, because uh, each of our GDOT districts has an allocation that they work within. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, question now from uh, my friend from Jasper, uh, Chairman Jasper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just when you mentioned 47.1.2 and 3, go back, because so those are, you said 6 million from existing funds, our funds, and 4 million from federal. Is that federal transit dollars that are that are coming in that are new dollars? And I guess the same in point three for broadband. Is it the same as rate six million from us and four? I wasn't sure. Yes, sir. Okay, so those are four million on the broadband from federal transportation funds or rural development funds. What's the I'm not sure where the line item Abby might know. Okay. I'm not sure I'm where the curious. line item from it from it yeah. comes. Okay. But it is utilizing the funds that we do have. The okay. commissioner might might know and might share. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, good question. Those will be federal transportation dollars from federal highway. And the broadband reference would be for a transportation purpose. We are very uh, eagerly working to strategize of how we can deploy broadband for transportation purposes, but there's a public private benefit potentially uh, to have access to some of the unserved areas uh, while uh, utilizing conduit that may be installed by the department or dark fiber uh, as well. So this is, this is again, DOT's, a little bit of a DOT's effort for the state effort of deploying broadband around the state, but it would be surface transportation dollars that are already coming to the department that have some flexibilities, but it has to be used for a transportation purpose. We're just trying to figure out how we can leverage uh, any of our transportation infrastructure that might be a help to uh, the private sector in unserved Georgia. Thank you, Commissioner. It was also good for meeting with you last week. Thank you for the time you shared with me. Um, so for, on that rural broadband, that would be for you guys like doing remote uh, traffic signal work. Is that sort of, I'm just kind of curious what you're looking at. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, sir. And really one of the biggest efforts we have is trying to get broadband on all our interstates. Uh, and that's again, safety driven. As we have hurricane evacuations and everybody from Florida loves to come to Georgia, uh, lots of our corridors, uh, 75 specific, specifically, we only have uh, camera coverage or data coverage at isolated locations. And some of our camera co coverage is via cell, cellular communication. So when the cell towers go out because there's no power, as, as we know as, as from Hurricane Michael, when we didn't have power in Southwest Georgia, uh, we were sort of blind, if you will. So we feel like having a fiber backbone, certainly along the interstates and then radiating out on some of the more important routes like the hurricane evacuation routes provides us with the ability to better manage uh, traffic uh, in those extreme events. And then also hopefully again, provide some backbone where it doesn't exist. So uh, we are, we are currently have a project to put, get broadband on all of Interstate 95. Uh, and we actually saw challenges with COVID, not hurricanes, but 
with COVID early on when everybody left the Northeast and wanted to go to Florida, we had significant traffic backs up in Georgia at the Florida line, but we couldn't manage those or see the traffic. So that's the kind of technology we're talking about, cameras, signs, and what we call probe data, such that we can manage traffic flows using technology. And that technology is actually your cell phone in your pocket or in your car. We can get pings of information, obviously anonymized, no public, no privacy issues there. We just know that a cell phone is going by and you can count, you can actually count cars with that technology. So those are the kind of things we're talking about, Mr. Chairman. We, again, we want to be innovative in deploying technology, but also know there's a secondary benefit, again, to probably unserved Georgia or providing some footprint that could help. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. That was an excellent explanation for that. And Chairman Jaspers has nodded profusely the last four minutes that you've talked. So you did a great job. The last question the chairman will, we've got to get going. But one last question. You mentioned that we're increasing our projects. So we've had deferred projects that we shut down and we stopped and we deferred through the pandemic. And so now we're looking at funding them. One of the questions that I want to make sure that we are, and I'm sure you've looked at it, but just an affirmation here would make me feel better. I became an economist because I saw how that works in real time. And through the pandemic in my area, there's a lot of businesses that were hurt, but some were not. Some yard work companies, the handyman, you needed little projects done at the house. And when you call them up and you say, hey, look here, I need you to come look about adding a deck on the back of my house. Well, you know, he might show up, but he's not hungry. And he don't give you a really good bid because he's not very hungry. Question I had, it's a long way to get to it. With the increase in capital projects, do our partners have the excess capacity for those projects to give us good bid? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I thought you were gonna ask me to come help help you with your deck and I'd, I'll be glad to do that. But yes, sir, uh, there is uh, capacity. We're still receiving, I think over four bids per project on average. Uh, and so competition is good, uh, capacity is there. And I might add that, you know, looking at our capital programs of where we are, uh, we've been pretty sustainable. And so that's been good and it continues to grow. And hopefully it continues to grow even larger and, uh, you know, having jobs, good paying jobs in the transportation construction field and, and, and transportation field period is good for the economy. I remind uh, you and this, this committee that the Carl Vinson study from a few years ago identified that for every dollar or million dollars invested in transportation in Georgia, there was a secondary benefit of $850,000 to Georgia, in Georgia. It actually was almost a one-for-one -one relationship of indirect benefit, not direct benefit, but indirect benefit, but 850,000 of a million stayed within Georgia. So that is a, that's a, a good, uh, uh, good for the economy. So yes, the under a four minute answer is that uh, there is capacity. Thank you so much for that. You were very generous with your time and uh, thank you for that. Thank you for what you do for our state, moving goods, services, uh, people around the state um, to make us safer uh, and doing it with uh, good stewardship in mind. I do thank you as a taxpayer. Uh, next we have um, Chris Tomlinson. Uh, is Chris on with us? Director, are you here with us? Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman, I'm here. Well, well, thank you for being here. Um, here. Let's let's uh, get started. I'm I'm sure that uh, Chairman Smith is going to uh, be on us pretty quick. So uh, let's let's roll on, if you don't mind, Mr. Director. Okay, I'll go ahead and share my screen.
for those on the committee, we're looking uh, in on the tracking sheet uh, in uh, 47.1.2, 47.1.3. Um, and um, uh, 16 point, um, section 16, 16.12. Um, if you're looking in the governor's budget, it's alphabetical, you can find it. Hopefully um, you're seeing the slides. Uh, yes, sir. They're coming through clearly. All right, great. Well, again, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Chris Thompson, the Executive Director for the State Road and Tollway Authority, Georgia Regional Transportation Authority, as well as the Atlanta Region Transit Link Authority. And today I'll be presenting uh, to you <clears throat> and members of the committee the FY 2022 Governor's Recommended Budget for those three authorities. In large part, um, what I'll be doing is I, uh, presenting you an alignment as well as confirming a lot of the information that you just heard from Commissioner McMurray. So moving forward into the presentation, I think around just a little bit in your tracking document, um, but line numbers are included on the final slide. I'd like to begin with Greta. Um, and is that, are you seeing the Greta budget slide in front of you right now? Uh, no, sir, it's kind of frozen. It shows House Appropriations Transportation Subcommittee. We do see that, but it hasn't turned to the next slide. All right, let me try swapping displays, see if that does it. Is it appearing now, Mr. Chairman? No, sir. Okay. Just one second, Let's see if we can. As you are, uh, or as you are, are working on that for the benefit of the committee, uh, I will just in, uh, talk about the uh, the transfer is 47.12, uh, 47.12.1, and the 16.12.1. Uh, 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 is uh, through HB 511. That's just transferring ATL uh, under the uh, GDOT. So that way, there you go. Uh, Executive Director, your uh, screen is sharing. Thank you. Screen is sharing now? Okay. <clears throat> Might be a little interesting because it's not showing on my side, but I know these slides backwards and forwards. So let's let's begin. So as I said, I'd like to begin with um, uh, Greta. So the governor's FY22 recommended budget maintains a flat budget. So this keeps the base budget of three hundred thirty thousand four hundred sixty-five dollars, as well as the administrative attachment of Greta to the Department of Community Affairs. Um, like in the AF, FY2021 budget. You also see a change in the purpose statement. This appears on line 16.14.1 of your tracking document. And again, this change just reflects the remaining responsibilities of Greta uh, since the express program has been moved to the ATL. Okay, moving on to the ATL. Um, the ATL, as mentioned by Commissioner McMurray, um, has been moved and administratively attached to uh, move from, excuse me, the Department of Community Affairs and the governor's recommend budget recommends uh, connecting it or attaching it administratively um, to the Department of Transportation. This change was part of HB 511, which was passed in last year's legislative session. On the following slide, I'm going to show you uh, the other side of that transfer. Okay. So hopefully it is now appearing in um, what you'll see. Uh, this is on line 47.12.1 of your tracking document. Um, the $12.8 million uh, in funding for the ATL, approximately $10.7 million of this 12.8 supports the express operations and the remaining 2.1 million supports uh, the ATL's planning function. A closer look at the express function. So express, if you're not familiar, is the state's regional commuter bus service. We run 27 routes out of 27 park and ride locations. 
I'm proud to say that even through the pandemic, uh, we've continued to run at least one morning and one afternoon trip for each route, despite reductions in service. Now, last but certainly not least, um, CERTA rounds out the governor's budget report with three major recommendations. First, what you'll see is the removal of the 10 for 10 appropriation, which was a mechanism to support ramp up uh, periods for the new toll roads on I-75 South, the 10 mile extension on I-85, as well as the Northwest Corridor Express lanes. Second, you'll see a large reduction in debt service payments for FY 2022. This is due to the payoff of GRB and Garby debt from 2011 and 2017. And finally, what you'll see is an increase for the debt service reserve fund for what we're calling the financing strategy for towing Resil resilience or FSTR plan. This $38.8 million is a one-time appropriation that will allow CERTA to hold the necessary reserve funds to then enter into a guaranteed revenue bond, which will allow CERTA and the state to refinance existing debt by leveraging historically low interest rates. It's estimated that this plan will save approximately, or actually over $411 million in interest over the 30 year term of the bond. Uh, on the next slide, I will um, provide you additional detail on FSTR. So as I mentioned, Mr. Chairman, we're actually very excited of, about this plan and our ability to leverage uh, these historically low interest rates. Uh, so going to more detail, and I know there's a lot of information um, on this slide, but going to more detail, you'll see that um, this plan seeks <clears throat> to restructure our current debt that sort of holds on tolling facilities in the state. And due to those lower interest rates afforded by the state's exceptional credit rating, a large amount of savings can be realized over the term of the bond. Now, it's important to note <clears throat> that not only does this allow CERTA to restructure its debt and plan for the future, but it'll allow uh, for CERTA to pay for its own tolling costs rather than having them funded by GDOT. The result of this is it frees up additional funds for GDOT for other capital construction pro projects, either via their MMIP project or um, through the savings from the elimination of the 10 for 10 plan, which again was originally scheduled uh, to last through FY 2027. So this plan is um, by removing that, um, that's $60 million that was planned to come from uh, G.2 CERTA over the next six years that is now no longer needed. Also of significance, um, principal interest and operating costs associated with this guaranteed revenue bond debt would be funded completely by tolling revenues, thus creating a, a true user fee and not relying on state motor fuel or other funding sources for these uh, toll costs uh, associated with our tolling program. Director, Director, that's a great point, and I'd just like to emphasize that for our committee, that um, those that use the service pay for the service. Uh, you got a great debt service coverage on this. It's basically for the common man. It's a cash out refi. We've got better rates uh, and actually lower obligation uh, in going forward. Chairman Estration had one question, question for you as we're going through. Thank you, Director. Um, I was just curious, but I understand that the toll use will cover the debt service, but what is the expense related to use which would exceed that? In other words, how short is the toll revenue from covering all operational expenses for operation of the toll lanes? And if uh, we need to connect offline, that, that'd be fine, but um, would appreciate the specifics as to those numbers. Uh, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Representative Evstration. It's a great question. Um, our plan includes us first paying for the ongoing operations and maintenance costs of the toll roads and then the debt service. Um, so again, um, both our O&M costs as well as the debt service would be covered. And as the chairman mentioned, um, we have been very conservative in our uh, budgeting. So we have a healthy uh, debt service coverage ratio, meaning we should be able to cover all of those costs and, and then have additional uh, revenues in case our projections uh, were off. Um, but it goes back to uh, what I mentioned earlier. 
uh, GDOT will no longer have to provide sort of that additional subsidy in the 10 for 10 in order to cover our operational costs. Okay, Director, we got another um, four minutes. Um, if, okay. if you could, if you could will, finish up your portion and then uh, have a couple of questions for you. Okay, uh, only a, a couple more slides. So I just wanted to give you a pie chart that um, gives you a graphical representation of our state funds budget broken out by debt service, the FSTR plan, and the uh, base funding for GTIB or the infrastructure bank program. And again, as you can see, the 10 for 10 item that traditionally would be in this chart has been removed. Um, again, I just want to reiterate again, this FSTR one-time appropriation of 38.8 million would not appear in future fiscal year uh, budgets. Um, moving on, I just wanted to give a refresher, um, a, a quick peach pass express lane overview. In purple, you'll see the current facilities uh, that are operational on I-85, the I-85 extension, I-75 South Metro and Northwest Corridor. <clears throat> in green, uh, you will uh, see the planned facilities to come into the network over the next few years. Uh, those include the SR-400 express lanes slated for completion in 2027, as well as the I-285 top end express lane scheduled for completion in phases uh, beginning in 2028 and um, finalizing or completing in approximately 2032. Last but not least, I just want to provide uh, you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, an update on some of our initiatives that we're working on to make Peach Pass even better for our users and our guests. Uh, we're currently working with Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta Airport on what we call Peach Pass Parking. This program will allow Peach Pass holders to pay for parking via their Peach Pass. Additionally, we're working on expanding our toll interoperability by integrating with the Easy Pass system. This will uh, create what we call toll interoperability up and down the entire Eastern Seaboard. It'll allow uh, anyone with a Peach Pass to travel in any toll facility from Florida up to Maine and as far west as Illinois, as well as it'll allow us to accept the Easy Pass on our roadways, thus reducing our um, need to chase what we call violators or people who may use the facilities but not already have a peach pass account and with well, that mr chairman thank you thank you so much director uh for the good of the committee there's one uh thing that we are going to look at uh and that is uh if you recall we had a change in uh in serta uh, through that garvey bond if you recall that we uh let uh in december uh, and we need to recognize that, um, and it will, as, as we go forward, of, of 5.7 million, those Garvey bonds that we added to the, to the budget uh, in the last time. Might have to add a separate line item there, 47.13.1.4, but uh, we'll, we'll square that up. Director, you are so kind to be with us uh, to explain a great, efficient project uh, for the state and an efficient use of our time. Thank you for being here. Uh, I've got to turn the, the uh, room over to uh, our friends in rules, uh, but uh, we will stand adjourned now. Thank you. Thank you.